Hi everybody, it's uh, John back again with another model inbox review. Today we're working on a plane that probably needs no introduction whatsoever, but I'm going to tell you what it is anyway. <laughs> it's a Boeing B29 Super Fortress, and the model that I'm actually going to be doing an inbox review on is the Airfix 72nd scale Boeing B29A Super Fortress and Series 7. We'll start straight away by going into the inbox review boxing history. It started off uh, as a red stripe release in 1966. This kit was actually the largest 72nd scale model in the world when it was released in 1966 um, in the red stripe label and the Roy Cross artwork is really really nice and this artwork carried through for the entirety of the history of the boxing releases throughout its entire release history. Um, but there were some differences in some of the boxings and I'll explain that in a minute. That's 1966 uh, red stripe boxing. Uh, 1967 uh, a company called Craftmaster that um, I think Airfix purchased Craftmaster lock stock and barrel um, in about 1966-67 and they actually acquired most of their uh, sorry it wasn't Craftmaster that was Kitmaster Craftmaster is um, uh, an American release company for Airfix in the 60s and early 70s. And Craftmaster um, were... I've, I've had some comments actually from some of my subbers in America that state that the Craftmaster plastic is definitely inferior to the quality of used in general release Airfix models. And you should be aware of this if you actually purchase uh, a Craftmaster release um, Airfix kit. They tend to be released in white plastic, and the plastic apparently is, yeah, it's not as good as the original Airfix release plastic. So that's 1967 with the Airfix release and Craftmaster. Then in 1970, MPC got involved in the American market. I think, I'm not quite sure whether MPC was a, a brand change name for Craftmaster or whether Airfix um, went with MPC as an agent for AFX models in 1970 with a different company. Perhaps some of my subbers might be able to put me right on that, I'm not sure. But MPC took over the agency marketing for the American market for AFX models. And in 1970, this was the boxing release um, for the B-29A Super Fortress. Then in 1972, um, this was the first boxing of the B-29 that I can remember seeing on the shelves. Um, it would have been about I would have been about seven years old at this time. Um, and the kit itself, this is called the Blue Logo Labelling Box Fourth Style Model Boxing. Um, <clears throat> and this came out about 1972-73 and replaced the Red Stripe in the early 70s. So that was 1972. And in 1973, MPC got involved again with another release. But this time it was with three different variants of the B29A. Um, these three different variants they did crop up on MPC releasing here and there as like single options in model build boxes but never as a three option release in one boxing other than this particular release in 1973 and I'm guessing that if you did come across one of these it would probably have quite a, a big price tag hanging off the box 1973 went to 1975 and we went to the red uh, round logo, Airfix logo, um, and the the actual total look of the box changed with the B29 Super Fortress label here being printed in big blue write, writing at the top of the box rather than a border underneath. Um, and also there are other interesting features in about 1975 for Airfix releasing where they gave you a little bit of background information about the the aircraft in question. Um, underneath its its title for the for the kit, and 1972 was was placed into this area here, as well. 1975 went to 1977, and MPC again released um, a model. Uh, this this was one of the options that was available in the three variant release, but this was a, this was just the only variant released in this particular box. But the difference with this one is that it actually had uh, a bonus feature of some crew members. Um, I think they were ground crew members rather than crew for the aircraft. It's marked scaled crewmen included, but I think they were ground crew rather than um, you know the aircraft crew itself. But that 
This again is, is probably quite collectible, I would have thought. 1977 went through to 1979. And a new face on the market for Airfix in America. This is US Airfix. I'm guessing this is probably an agency set up by Airfix in America um, to market Airfix kits. Um, and 1979, of course, uh, was the year when Airfix were in serious trouble in Europe. Um, and yeah, the next boxing, that's 1979, the next boxing is the first boxing released by Palatoy. And something happened in history at around about 19, 1979, 1980. Sorry, this is a 1980 release. Um, there was a law passed in the UK, and I don't know if a lot of people in America and other countries realise this, but in 1979, um, there was a law passed uh, which involved all types of toys uh, that were sold on the open market for children had to have all images of violence removed from their boxing. And this really affected a lot of Airfix uh, model boxings because when you think about it, a lot of the military aircraft and tanks and other all sorts of different stuff, ships, everything... It involved quite a lot of imagery of violence in war and everything. And if you'll notice, all the flashing from the, the rear, the defensive gunners and all the fighters that were attacking this bomber stream were actually taken out completely. And even the other bombers were taken out completely. And this aircraft was superimposed on a, a reddish and yellowy-orange uh, background. Um, and I do remember this boxing coming out in 1979 to 1980. There were a lot of models released in this style of boxing. So that's 1980. Um, and 1980 went to 1982 when MPC again released another variant from their three option boxes. Um, and this was the um, Jolly Rosa or Jolly Rosier. Or jo I think it's Jolly Rosa. Um, this was one, again, as I said, one of the three options available, one of the three variant boxings that was earlier in the 70s. And this kit was released in 1982 by the MPC US agent for Airfix. 1982 went to 1983, um, and this was the Panatoy, this is the more recognisable release that Panatoy offered Airfix kits in, where the, the model is built up and shown an image on top of a blueprint image. Um, it's quite interesting to note also that this is the alternative option available in the kit other than Eddie Allen, which has been featured on virtually every front of the box. Jolton Josie was the optional uh, version available in the Airfix kit. And um, I remember, because I did build this kit before when I was about 12, 13 years old, and it was a complicated and quite challenging build for me at that time. Um, but I did build Jolton Josie out of that kit um, and I can remember it was a very rewarding, challenging, but very rewarding model build. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was probably one of the first models I built that was a complicated kit that I actually do, did it all myself. Um, 1983 went to 1990. This was um, Heller Humbrol, um first boxing of this particular aircraft. Um, and they also have three flying hours attached to the, the, the Series 7 logo here in the corner. Um, this type of style of boxing, as I said, come out in about 1989, 1980, and the B-29 was released in 1990 in this boxing from um, Heller. 1990 goes to 2005, and we have a jump in style of boxing because this is actually a twin kit set. This is the US, Air, uh, US Bombers uh, starter set and it was one of their first efforts at starter sets the Boeing B-29 was joined by the consolidated B-24J Liberator which was obviously a Series 5 kit and in this set you also had a set of paints a tube of glue and a brush um, and I've got a feeling that the kit that I'm building actually is from this set but the consolidated Liberator um, I'll explain to you in a minute about it the consolidated Liberator I didn't buy as part of the deal. Um, 2005 goes to 2008. This is the last boxing release from Heller. And in actual fact, it's the last boxing release of the FX B29 because, I'm, uh, to my knowledge, Hornby Productions have never released this kit. And it's a shame because it's actually a half decent model. Um, but this was the last um, boxing offering from Airfix of the B29 Super Fortress. And this was released by Heller, of course. I'll just leave you with a nice image. Um, an interesting image because I do want to quickly just mention before we go into the actual review of the kit. Um, 
this particular image is not of a Boeing B-29. It does look like a B-29, but it actually isn't. It's actually an RAF Boeing Washington Mark 1, a B Mark 1 Washington. And the, the reason why it's in RAF markings is because in 1950, um, when the RAF was handed the responsibility of strategic bombing um, in the European theatre, alongside the USAF aircraft that were based in Europe, in Germany and Britain at the time, the RAF realised that they didn't have an aircraft um, because the, the Avro Lincoln was completely unsuitable and it couldn't accommodate the, the, uh, the size of the atomic bombs in manufacture at the time. And the RAF required a strategic bomber that could accommodate those bombs. And the only aircraft in the Western world that could do that was the B-29. And the RAF purchased, I think, some 16 aircraft um, forming a nucleus of a bomber squadron, Strategic Air Command for the RAF. And these were a stopgap interim um, aircraft requirement. And they utilised B-29s for approximately 18 months until the appearance of the Vickers Valiant and smaller bombs that could be accommodated into the bomb bay of Canberra bombers um, that were in service at the time in 1951 when these aircraft were relinquished and handed back to the USAF. They were originally B-29 aircraft in service with the USAF and it was almost like they were lent. I think they might even have been leased by the RAF. But the RAF bomber is the subject of the kit that I want to build. And I'll be building it from a B-29, but it will actually be built as a Boeing Washington B Mark 1. Right, so what I want to quickly do now is I want to quickly just pan the camera down onto the table. With a bit of luck, I can do that quite effectively. There we go. That should be about right. There we go. Now, the box I know isn't an Airfix box, but I didn't buy the kit in an Airfix box. It was actually purchased in this style of, this style of box. And I just kept it in this box because it's easier to to store. <laughs> we'll get the kit out. The box is quite full of plastic because this kit is actually quite large. We'll put the box down here, get it out of the way. And we'll take that out of the bag and I'll just show you the instruction leaflet and the decals. Like I normally do in the correct order. Right. The instruction leaflet is A4. It's typical of Heller, Humbrol style of instruction leaflets um, dished out in Airfix kits in around about the mid 2000s, but probably 2000 to 2010 when, when uh, Hornby Productions took over ownership of this company. Um, the kit builds up in 15 parts and the 16th part is actually the painting and decal application guide here. And at the back of the uh, instruction leaflet you've got some assembly instructions and some assembly keys there for the for the instructions themselves um, and this is unusual because usually they have this information at the front of the instructions and not at the back um, so anyway the kit builds up in 15 parts um, I'm not going to go pedantically through these instructions because you know most of the instructions with Airfix especially large kits are much of a muchness but basically I'll just explain how the kit builds You've got section one which involves the forward flight cabin area and floor pan with all the pilots um, and the walkway between the two pressurised sections fore and aft. And then at the third section there you've got a navigator's floor um, and I would say that's probably two flight engineers um, who sit in that particular area. I'll talk about the pilots when we get to the parts in a minute because the pilots are interesting. Um, sections 2, 3, 4 and 5 are basically the remote defensive guns. They're actually, the guns on the B-29 were actually remotely controlled. They didn't have a gunner inside the, the uh, gun housing, but they were remotely controlled by um, aiming sections, which I think was something to do with this section here. This might be a flight engineer or navigator's position and two gunners, or it could even be a gunner for the rear and two gunners for the front guns, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, that might be apparent with some research. Section 6 and 7 are basically building the starboard interior for the fuselage. Um, section 6 is basically assembly of the bomb doors. An interesting feature of the Airfix B-29 is that the bomb doors actually open and close to close the bomb bay off or have it open. You can have them both open and close. They operate perfectly well. And the bomb racks for the bombs actually act, act 
that they act as the hinges for the the hinge catches rather for the bomb doors the hinges being on the bombs and there's a couple of um, nice little windows inside there fuselage there and the walkway fits in around the top of the bomb bay it's quite quite self-explanatory and easy to follow section eight is the um, the port side of the fuselage um, which again houses the movable bomb doors and the bomb racks and all the bombs and section nine you've got the nose wheel assembly and the rudder and the rudder and all the elevators and ailerons on this kit do rotate, uh, do do move. They all re elevate and um, <clears throat> move from left to right to activate the rudder. And the nose wheel assembly actually retracts into the nose section of the aircraft as well. And in section 10, you're putting the fuselage halves together and um, all the gun positions and interior detail and everything. And that's showing you there, do not cement the nose wheel because that retracts into the nose gear. And then you've got some of the glazing and the canopy sections there, which get fitted as well. The rear gunner's canopy there. I don't usually fit those until um, the aircraft's been painted. It's just I just find it easier to to paint the canopy and the glass glazing part, parts. So that it's a lot easier to do that. Um, section eleven is the wing assembly and tailplane assembly, and again all the elevators and ailerons move. And section 12 is the inner and outer engine nacelles, again with the main undercarriage oleos which fit into the inner nacelles, and these retract into the nacelles as well. I think all the wheels move as well on the, this kit too, the nose wheel and the main undercarriage wheels, they all move, um, which is nice. And the hubs are separate to the wheels, so you can paint the hubs separately and have the tyres painted separately and have it nice and neat and easy. Section 13 is the assembly of the four engines. Um, they're quite nicely detailed engines, they're nothing to write home about in terms of super detail, but they're quite nicely detailed. And the propellers are quite nicely crafted on this kit, as you'll see in a minute with the parts, but there's four engines and the props are quite nice. Um, seriously large piece of kit, this kit, when it goes together. Section 14 is the assembly of the airframe <clears throat> and the forward piece of the canopy there, as you can see, and all the tailplane assembly. And then in, to finish off, you just fit the engines at the bottom of section 14 there. And yeah, that all just goes to this. Very, very easy to follow. Section 15 is finishing off. You basically um, have the doors for the undercarriage, main undercarriage oleos and the nose wheel either in the up position with the wheels raised, or you can have it in the lowered position with the wheels lowered. Um, I would probably have the undercarriage lowered with all, all the doors open and just have the undercarriage so it can retract inside, but you still have to have the doors open. One of the things about this particular kit that's interesting, or before I mention this, you've also got um, a ram at the back there. Now, <clears throat> I think that's, that's some sort of um, buffer for the tail when the aircraft comes into land. <clears throat> Um, you can either have it in the raised position in the upper section there, or you can have it in the lowered position with a ram, and I think I'll probably have it in the lowered position with a ram. But one of the things that's, that is interesting about the Airfix kit, I don't know if it's the same with other 72nd scale versions of this model from other companies, but the B-29 is um, a serious tail sitter. The weight in the tail is absolutely phenomenal. And there is probably not enough lead in the entire world to put into the nose of this aircraft to get it to sit on its nose wheel. But Airfix have actually come up with a nice little a nice little thing here because when you have the aircraft in the lowered position, can you see in that little sub drawer in there in the bottom section, you've got what's called an access ladder that goes into the rear hatchway, the doorway in the back of the fuselage. And that hatch ladder actually supports the tail of the aircraft so it will sit on its nose wheel no problem whatsoever and airfix have done that on purpose so that you know you don't have to worry about the fact that there's no room in the forward section of the fuselage for any weight whatsoever because of the detail on the kit now section 16 is the paint and deco application guide and it's really easy to follow because really there's only three colors you've got um <coughs> glossy yellow 69 which covers um Eddie Allen's tail flashes, which are yellow. The main airframe is completely silver, and the propellers and the tyres and also the de-icing strips on the rudder 
sorry, not the rudder, the tail fin, the tail plane and wings are also in matte black, <coughs> which is matte 30, of course. <coughs> sorry, I think I've got a frog in my throat. And the two variants here, are, the two options are there for Eddie Allen, which Eddie Allen was an aircraft that was named after Boeing's chief test pilot, who actually flew the first prototype B-29. His name was Eddie Allen. And Joton Jolsey was one of the aircraft operating in the Pacific Theater. Um, it was just a very popular aircraft, did a lot of missions, blah, blah, blah. And these two variants are covered by the Airfix kit. That's the instructions covered. Right. <clears throat> the decals. Now, there's a bit of a balance with the Airfix kit, as with a lot of Airfix kits, especially the four-engine and the, you know, the four-engine bombers and the big kits, Series 5 and upwards. The, the older the kit, the better the plastic. The newer the kit, the better the decals. <clears throat> and I'm lucky here because I've got a 2000, I'm pretty sure it's a 2005 release from the twin US bombers set. And the decal sheet on this kit is actually half decent. Um, the register on the markings are actually very good, as you can see. There's no abnormalities in those decals. The printing of Joel and Josie's figurine there for the nose art is quite nice. The Pacific Pioneer, I quite like that. I might have built this kit again as Joel and Josie if I wasn't doing a B1 Washington. Um, the backing film is quite clear. It's The, the decals aren't seriously raised. There is a, a minor ridge, but it's not a lot. Um, and the the colours, the decals are nice. The thing is, if you get an older kit, the chances are the plastic is going to be a better, it's going to be more crisp, less flash. It's going to have less problems with the plastic. But your decals in the early kits, especially the 60s release and early 70s release, the decals on them were pretty dire. <laughs> The quality on the decals was pretty bad graphics in, in those days. It was, it, they were renowned for it. Right, we'll just get the parts out quickly. <clears throat> I'm not going to go pedantic with the parts because the parts are actually quite nice. Um, I'm not joking, they are actually quite nice. I was pleasantly surprised. The quality of these parts aren't too bad either. Um, you know, the, the, there is a bit of flash here and there, but as I said before on a few of my other videos, I'm not really somebody who dislikes flash. To me, flash just indicates that the parts have been cast correctly um, because this stuff's squeezing out the end. You know, it's, it's just the way it is. Um, <clears throat> there's quite a, few, quite a few sprues here, and I'm trying to get them out without breaking stuff off the sprues because there's a lot of parts on the sprue. And, Fortunately for me, they're, most, they're mostly all on the sprue, which is great. Normally with a kit of this size, you've got parts lying loose all over the shop. But they're all nicely on the trees, which is great. And there's one part off the tree here. That's it's just a bomb fin at the back. Right. <clears throat> we'll start with the transparencies. Lots of people like the transparencies. It indicates the quality of the kit. Um, and I'm going to try and show you the quality of this kit quite well. I'm going to put my finger inside this forward glazing dome here. Now, my fingerprints aren't that clear, but you can just make out that there are fingerprints in there. And this part is actually crystal clear. It's quite thick. And the frame moulding on the front is actually quite heavy, um, which is a shame because I don't think the real aircraft would have been that heavy. But it is quite a clear, nice, nicely crafted piece and those astrodomes and the gunners view domes are quite nice as well there's a couple of navigation lights there for the wings um, which is quite nice but that that part is quite good I'm, I'm quite impressed with that and then you've got the upper detailing um, for the canopy there and that part that's quite crisp as well the framing on it again is quite heavy um, although it is quite heavy on the real plane, the front doming isn't actually as heavy as the kit, but the front, the top of the canopy rather, the framing on it is about right. You've got the gunners glazing there, which is quite clear as well. Um, you can see my fingers quite in, you know, it's indicating quite easily there that you can see, you can't make out the fingerprints, but you can see that there are prints on them. And then there's the, the side windows there that go in the fuselage house, and they're quite crisp as well. 
quite clear. The part, the transparency parts are quite good. Now then, <clears throat> I'll just quickly go through the sprues. There is, there is one thing I do want to mention about the parts on the Airfix kit. Um, like a lot of Airfix models depicting aircraft of this era, the parts are covered quite fastidiously in rivets. It's Rivet City. The thing with the Boeing B-29 is, is that it wasn't flush riveted. Um, it was... It was standard riveted, like most Boeing bombers. This B-17 was the same as this. The B-29 was no exception. And the rivets, although they do look a little bit heavy, they, they are apparent on the real plane. And I think they might require a little bit of sanding down, but I, I think, you know, I think they're going to be all right. There's a bit of a bend on uh, those parts there. Can you see that? I don't know how. I think I might have to jig those in when you glue the... Um, the elevators together but the tailplane parts there are quite nicely riveted and the detail on this quite good not too bad the engines engine detail on the on this kit is much of a muchness to be honest with you it's pretty common with most airfix bombers the actual engine detail is is it's okay you know it's not bad they'll paint up nice and the engine cowlings are quite nice as well a little bit of flash on these parts here and there but not too much the engines are quite Especially the forward side of the engines are quite badly flashed, but they'll clean up all right. They'll be fine. The engine cowlings there, they're quite nicely moulded. Very nice. So that's the first sprue. Second sprue comprises the propellers and a lot of the interior parts. And then we've got two of these guys that I want to show you. <clears throat> now, I don't know about you, but I'm not much of a fan of Airfix bomber crew. I am a fan of Airfix pilots, but not their bomber crews. Um, I think you have to get to kits, um, Series 4 and 5 anyway, that were designed and produced from about 1978 onwards to end up with some decent crew members inside these bombers. Because prior to 1978, these were the guys that flew your bombers from Airfix. And I'm going to be honest with you, they look like they've been designed by Geiger, don't they? They look like some of the crew members from that alien ship in the film Alien. Oh my God, he's growing out of the chair. I think he really is. I think he's probably glued to the chair. The other thing that's interesting is to see the thickness of those main oleo undercarriage legs there. Even though they're that thick, the undercarriage oleo legs on the FX B-29 has been earmarked by professional model makers in other reviews to state that they are actually quite vulnerable to snapping um, because they're a tight maneuver when you're pushing them in and out of the engine nacelles and especially in the nose wheel leg and I'll show you the nose wheel leg in a minute why it's so ver uh, why it's so vulnerable to snapping um, <clears throat> and I'll talk about something as well to, re to resolve that problem um, I won't show you that loose part because there's plenty of them on here. <clears throat> You've got some of the, uh, the crawl way there between the two uh, pressurised sections fore and aft. And there's the engine nacelles. They're quite nicely detailed as well. Each engine nacelle has got two separate uh, exhaust stubs, which is nice. Um, you could paint the exhaust stubs a slightly different colour silver to the rest of the airframe to make them stand out before you apply them to the airframe, which is quite nice. And the bomb fins there, they're typical bomb fins from Airfix bombs, it's typical, you know. The engine exhaust stubs have got holes, they're bored out at the end, which is a nice touch. A lot of them, especially a lot of RAF bombers that Airfix produced, the exhaust stubs were just bits of plastic. They didn't even have a pipe effect at the back. They weren't great, but the B-29s isn't bad. The third, sorry, the fourth sprue here. You've got all the bombs on the sprue, which is you know, the standard. You know, no need to real go into any detail. The machine guns for the defensive turrets there—they're actually quite nice. They're nicely molded. They're not too big either. I think they are a little bit big, but they're not massively too big. You know, they look like twenty millimeters instead of seventy-five millimeter guns, which the Airfix first-generation Wellington had, and the Hamden—they were horrendous. And then you've got more of these Geiger 
Bonner Crewman from the film Alien. They, I really, really was not a fan of these guys. Um, but Airfix didn't put anyone else into the into the bombers until late in the 70s. That's all the sprue plastic. I just want to show you, I'm not going to show you all of the wing parts. I'll just show you one of each. You've got the upper surface of the wing here, and I'm going to try and show you the, the rivet detail on here. You can see it. The rivet detail on this kit isn't too bad. Um, it is there, and it might need a tiny bit of sanding down, but the B29 was rivet city, I'll be honest with you. And the parts, the parts are quite nice. There is a little tiny bit of flash here and there, but they're, you know they're relatively clear, which is great. The under surface of the wing here, there's a lower surface for the aperture there for the main undercarriage. Um, again, it's quite crisp. There's a little bit of flash, bits of bobs popping off here and there. But the rivets, the rivet detailing on this wing is not bad. You can see it there. It's quite, it's quite nice. The flaps on the B29 were huge, weren't they? Look at them massive so nice wing parts i'll just show you one of the fuselage halves <clears throat> i'm trying not to go too much in detail with the parts because the parts on this kit are pretty much run of the mill for airfix but the, the overall finish and the overall um outline of the aircraft airframe is really nice um again the rivets on the fuselage there they're about right. I'm looking at this picture of the RAF kit and here and all the rivets that are on this part are on that photo. Definitely, It's definitely correct. But again, they, they might need a little touch of sanding down, on the, especially on the fin there. They're quite heavy on the fin, actually. But it's a nice, it's a big kit, isn't it? I mean, that's my hand. It's a big kit, big model. There's actually one, one of my subbers, um, he's doing a project on the museum at Duxford. And I think he's built the Academy uh, Academy B29 Super Fortress as the um, the aircraft that's in the Duxford Museum, which is quite nice. And uh, it might be interesting to view his videos to see how this kit builds differently to the Academy kit. Because um, although they're different companies... The detail on the Academy kit is, as far as I know, it's pretty similar to this one. Um, you know, and the, the finish that my friend James got, he's got his own channel. You should, you should, um, you should have a look at his his channel. I'll try and post a a, a link on the uh, comments, on the description. Sorry, this video, so that you can check his videos out and have a look at them. But his B29 came out quite nicely. What I quickly want to do now, <clears throat> um, before we go into the summing up of the kit, I just want to quickly bring the video back up to the computer because what I want to do, I quickly want to go through the options and costs before I go through the rest of it. Because the options and costs on this kit are quite interesting. Some of the scales available on this kit are very interesting. So what we'll do, I'll just bring the bring the camera in view so you can see that lovely view of B of a a B Mark One Washington. It's lovely. Right, <clears throat> options and costs. The options and costs for this particular kit for this for a no for B twenty nine are quite interesting. They start in one seven hundredth scale with a company called Skywave. Um, this is a Battle of Japan uh, aircraft pack, and it comprises, I believe, two B twenty nines and two of each of the Raiden and Shoki um, defense, air defense fighters from the Japanese um, air defense force. Um, and this is an interesting kit. I'm, I'm not sure how much these kits cost because I've never seen them on sale in England. But they are, you probably could buy them, you know, you could probably get them through the internet, through special order. Um, and they're quite interesting. They're small, <laughs> they're very small, but they're quite interesting. And I think they're used for dioramas um, in conjunction with 1700 scale ships. Uh, which would be an interesting project for somebody who likes to build ships. You could, you know, use these um, <clears throat> in the air above the vessels. It would be quite interesting. So Skywave build a 1700 scale kit. Again, I'm sorry, but I don't have any pricing for that. Um, in 1246 scale, 
There are two kits, in fact. One is by a company called Hobby Time. Um, and Hobby Time build the B29 Super Fortress, as I said, in one 246 scale. The kit only has 29 parts. And as you can see, the parts, <clears throat> well, they don't look great, do they? <laughs> it doesn't even have any glazing. But uh, yeah, it's a small kit. It's not very big. <clears throat> if you can imagine, it's four times smaller than the uh, the Airfix kit. It's interesting. Right. <clears throat> one 246 scale goes to one 208 scale. The other, the other, let me just have a quick look. The other kit that is built in one 246 scale is by Sunel. And I haven't got any images of that kit, sorry. One 208 scale, a company called Sanwa produced the B29 Super Fortress in this scale. Um... Again, I've not seen this in this country. I've not seen it in Europe anywhere. I've not seen it for sale at all. Um, but it is available in Japan, I would have thought. And in the Far East. Um, the next option is one 175th scale. And this is an interesting case because this particular model is incredibly collectible. And I would think it would fetch... Well, I mean, I've got an earmark of about 50 to £100, pound, but it could fetch more if the condition of the box is really good and it's complete. Oh, the sky's the limit because these kits are old and they're very rare. But this was a Strategic Air Command bomber set and it incorporated a B-29A, a B-36B and a B-47 and a B-52 bomber, all in... One 175th scale, and they were released by Ravel in the late 50s. Um, an interesting scale as well. I believe each one of these kits in this box had its own stand, which is, you know, it, it, it would have been a nice model to build, I would have thought. Quite interesting to have on display as well. 175th then goes to 144th scale, and this is a scale that some of the options are quite easily available. For ten to seventeen pound, Academy Mini Crafter one hundred and forty four scale B twenty nine of the Enola Gay, um, which was of course the bomber that dropped the Hiroshima bomb. Um, this is joined by the Crown kit, which is available for fifteen to twenty pound. The um, the Academy Mini Craft, by the way, is actually the Crown kit, um, <clears throat> and this is available for fifteen to twenty quid in one hundred and forty four scale. Again, you can get this quite easily on eBay. I've seen it quite often. Um, also, in 144 scale, Fujimi do a number of variants in boxings of the B29. Some of them are reversary sets like this one, where you can get the B29 bomber, and you can get a Raiden and a Shoki fighter, um, all in 144 scale, complete in the same box. They also do um, another kit of a B29A, with a P-51 in 144 scale and an F-86 Sabre. Um, these retail for about 25 to 35 quid for both of these two kits, which is interesting. Um, again, they're quite rare in this country, but I believe you can get them quite easily in Japan even now. Um, and it'd probably be quite an interesting kit, but again, the B-29 from Fujimi is actually the crown kit. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, the B29 is also available from Fujimi as an individual kit, and that, I think that retails between 15 and 20 quid, and that's rarer than the three plain sets that you, you can see here. Um, Minicraft, this is not to be mistaken for Academy Minicraft, this is Minicraft, a separate company. They also do the crown kit in 144 scale, and that kit can often be picked up for as little as a fiver, but it's usually between, I would say, 8 and 10 pounds. <clears throat> 144 scale is also covered by this kit by Ravel and again this is the crown kit it gives you an idea of what the model looks like because the image of the model is actually on the front of the box and as you can see it's not incredibly well accurate and the canopy is pretty dire isn't it but uh, it is 144 scale and it is from Ravel and this kit is available for about 10 to 15 quid 144th then goes to 133rd scale, and um, I've seen this kit go for as little as three quid, but it often goes for between 20 and 30 pound. Um, this is 133rd scale B29 in Ravel boxing. Um, you can also get 
in one 120th scale on a couple of kits. The Hobbycraft offering is available. Um, I think I've seen this kit once on sale on eBay for about £17, um, but it didn't sell. So I haven't actually got an offering for how much this kit would actually cost you to buy, but it, you know, it didn't sell for 17, but it might not say that it wouldn't. Um, also, Idea build this kit in 120th scale. The um, the other kit is actually the Idea box from the other kit from Hobbycraft, and this kit is again available for an unknown price. I have no idea how much. I've never seen it for sale in this country at all ever. Um, 120th scale then goes to a hundred one one hundredth scale. The Entex kit offering. Um, again, I've got no pricing. The kit itself actually looks a lot better than the Revell model, the Crown kit in 144th. It does look a lot better, doesn't it? Um, the Entex model, I think, is based on this kit, the Murasan kit, um, as is all the 1 100 scale offerings. The Murasan kit is quite common in the Far East. Um, I have seen it a couple of times in the UK, but again, I've never seen it sell in the UK because the sellers usually want between 15 and 20 quid. And it just hasn't sold. Um, it's also available, the Murasan kit is available under the Sunny Trieste offering. Um, again, I've got no pricing for that either. And also UPC market this kit, um, and it is often sold for between 28 and 30 quid in the UK, but it's the only kit I've ever seen for, that's actually sold in the UK. 1 100 scale goes to 176, an unusual scale here, but this is Aurora. Um, Aurora, they're the only company that produce this kit in 176. Uh, quite pricey because it's quite collectible. It goes for about 60 to 70 pound. And in 172nd scale, the offerings are quite easy. Academy Boot do their offering for about uh, 11 to 35 pound. The Airfix kit, let me just pick this back up. The Airfix kit itself goes for between 11 and 35 quid. Sorry, 12 and 50 quid for the Airfix Super Fortress, about 60 pound for the Twin Bomber set, and the MPC Airfix offering goes for about 25 to 40 quid. So that's interesting, that's the Airfix and MPC offerings. And Doyosha also build the, um, the B29, and this is for sale for about 35 to 55 quid. Um, 72nd scale isn't the biggest scale you can get the, the V29 in, it also comes in 148th. Um, Hasegawa produce this kit in, for about 75 to 125 quid, depending on the age and condition of the box. You can also get the monogram kit for 64 to 110 pound, and then you've got the Revell offering for about 80 to 100 pound. But the Hasegawa and the Revell boxings are just the the, uh, the monogram kit inside, um, and also. Interestingly enough, you can get this kit in 132nd scale. This is a, a vac form kit, and these are two vac form sheets from a company called ID Models. And ID Models isn't the only company that sell the idea, the ID Models offering. The kit's not cheap, it's about 80 to 100 pounds for a vac form kit, that's quite a lot. Um, but it's also available for about 85 quid from a company called Trigger Models. And this gives you an idea of what the back form kit comes in the box like and you know not my idea of an, of, a, of an easy kit to build i wouldn't have thought so that's the um the options and costs just leave you with a nice image there of a, a washington b mark one um which is quite nice what i want to do now um I want to go through the gump of the kit, but I want to give you something nice to look at so that you, you've got something nice to look at whilst I'm going through the gump of the kit. So I'll just pan the camera back down to the um, the, the plans here and so I can show you the guide. You can see the guide there. That's better, isn't it? I'll give you something to look at whilst I'm just bellowing this stuff out. Right. The kit we're doing an inbox review on is the Airfix Boeing B29 Super Fortress, serial number 07001, and its release date was 1966, and it's scaled in 172nd scale. There are decals for two versions. 
the Eddie Ellen and Jolton Josie, both B-29 Super Fortresses from the USA F Pacific Theatre, circa 1945. There are 196 parts on four grey plastic sprues and 11 parts on two clear plastic sprues, totalling 207 parts altogether. The dimensions of the kit are quite vast. The kit is about 16 and a half inches long. It has a wingspan of 23 and a half inches and it stands about four and a half inches high on its undercarriage. We've gone through the options and costs and they are quite a few. One of the things I do want to say is that the 48 scale B29 is really, really nice. Um, and if you fancy something unusual and big, but unusual, um, it's not a bad offer. Pricey as well though, but uh, yeah, it's not bad kit. Conclusions. Now, if you like building Airfix bomber kits, then really the Boeing B-29 Super Fortress is probably the Airfix bomber kits of bomber kits. It has over 200 parts and moving everything, including its bomb doors and retractable undercarriage, all of the elevators, ailerons and the rudder move, and so do all of the gun positions. The guns elevate and rotate. It's very nicely detailed with the interior comprising of all the pilot crews, floor pans and interior um, compartments and a walkway that goes above a highly detailed bomb bay. There are actually two bomb bays on this kit and they have moving bomb doors as well so that you can close them up and open them up for viewing. Um, it's also uh, got nicely moulded airframe with lines and rivets that aren't really that much overdone. They might need some sanding, but it's probably not that bad. But forget about getting enough weight in the nose of this thing, as there is not enough room. But the kit does supply a rear access ladder, which supports the tail pretty much okay. Now, there are some aftermarket recommendations, and the scale aircraft conversion set for the replacement undercarriage struts, and these metal ones are well worth it, because the plastic ones are prone to snapping if you retract the landing gear too many times. It would highly be recommended, sorry, I would highly recommend this kit as it is one of Airfix's must build kits if you're into Airfix and you're into four engine 70 second scale bombers. And when finished, it should bring a smile to your face in much the same way that the Airfix Vulcan does. Now, as I said before, I have built this kit. I was quite young when I built it and I did find it quite taxing and quite demanding a kit especially when you're putting the fuselage halves together. There's quite a lot that you have to locate into position and then ensure that it stays there whilst you're laying the glue down and uh, fixing and jigging the other half of the fuselage to ensure everything moves. And then you've got to repeat the process again with all the moving control surfaces. Now the Airfix B29 I think is a reasonable kit. It's actually very detailed. It's not too badly priced either because you can get an Airfix kit for, a, I mean, I've seen it go for as little as a tenner. I've actually seen an MPC kit go on eBay for as little as £7.50, but usually they go for about £12 to £15, but I have seen some of the early release boxings go for about 45 to 50 quid. So it isn't a cheap kit, but if you hold out for the price, you can usually get it quite cheap. But it's a beautiful kit to build. It's very, very impressive when it's put together. And it does have all those lovely moving parts. So I do think, it, you know, as Airfix kits go, I think it's, it's an Airfix must-have for collectors and builders alike. So that's the inbox review done for the B29. I hope that you've um, found something interesting and useful in this video. I'll see you for the next ones, lads, and I hope all your modelling projects go smooth and dandy and I hope you have no serious issues and I hope that uh, you're enjoying your, your projects that you're doing. Um, if you have any questions please put them in the comments. If you have any information to give me about some of the comments I've made on here um, I would greatly appreciate it and any questions that you have I'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. Um, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you for the next video. Bye for now.